Right now, we'll have a um, short talk by Milos Meriak and uh, Chiro Katuto, who will tell us um, how RFID can be used to reveal uh, social contacts and give us some statistics on the little experiment that they've been doing uh, during this very Congress. And that's hopefully going to be very interesting. Unfortunately, the third person, Aesthetics, won't be here today because he's uh, ill. But I hope it's nevertheless be, uh, going to be very, very interesting and you can enjoy the talk. Hello, everyone. Uh, I want to welcome you in uh, our open AMD uh, talk where we want to tell you what our findings were with the current uh, instance of uh, Open Beacon and uh, Open AMD. Uh, we tell you about what new friends we found, uh, which uh, built on top on Open AMD. We'll show you what data we can retrieve with the current versions and uh, what the implications are. We will give you a short introduction uh, to the hardware so you get an idea what the capabilities are and thus what the implications are uh, and we will show you uh, what the current status of our uh, data mining efforts is and uh, how our web APIs uh, could look like and yeah unluckily uh, we had a, lo a lot of misluck with this uh, project so this is only <laughs> uh, shows the, uh, at the end that uh, people now uh, also get ill despite the fact that they had to work very hard to compensate other people that went missing along the project uh, progress. So uh, just to say it in advance, uh, this project was only possible because very few people worked really, really hard the last, uh, say, two or three weeks and made this possible, uh, especially people like Aesthetics who unluckily can't attend here. Uh, he uh, did uh, amazing work with the um, uh, data mining APIs and uh, unluckily we can show, we can't show uh, you uh, his part of the presentation but we try to do our best. And uh, Chiro, uh, which is basically one of the new friends of uh, Open uh, Beacon and MD, uh, is presenting a group that built very nice uh, software on top which uh, shows what data is actually there from the data we retrieve. So the first time it's actually visible, not only to mathematicians and sociologists, what data is there, but really everyone can appoint uh, their browsers to our website and it's very visible what uh, amount of data results and uh, uh, therefore uh, you have to ask yourself if you really uh, have nothing to hide. Okay, so let's uh, give a brief introduction to uh, the Open uh, Beacon hardware. Open Beacon uh, exists since something like uh, four years now. It started basically uh, when we were discussing with a friend how to uh, basically um, enable uh, scientists for example, to examine crowd situ crowded situations where people get killed because panic situations emerge. Um, and the background back then was that uh, people regularly got uh, killed in Saudi Arabia uh, on the Hajj, on the Yali Hajj, because you have this huge crowded situations there. People have to uh, fulfill waypoints there and uh, you have huge cities of tens when the fire starts, people get panicking and basically more people are killed by the resulting panic than by the actual fire. So we thought about, okay, how could it look like if you want to track a huge amount of people? Uh, you obviously, there are several existing technologies available, namely low frequency RFID and high frequency RFID. You probably know low frequency well, which is basically 100 kilohertz approach which is used in cars still and uh, basically in uh, huge sports events. 13.56 megahertz you probably know very well from your uh, a tra a travel uh, passes or your subway tickets. 
Um, and all these existing possibilities share the problem that you have to provide a very tight net of readers around the city, for example, if you want to track people. So we try to find a novel approach where the basic design pattern was that it has to last at least a few weeks and that um, it's easy to deploy. Obviously, if you have to uh, control a huge crowd of people, you can't lay wires everywhere and stuff like that. Uh, so uh, you need a wireless approach and because uh, current technologies are very low power, namely 2.4 gigahertz, and 2.4 gigahertz is uh, available worldwide, we decided to stick to 2.4 gigahertz because we learned the more generic your system is, the more people can contribute. Therefore, we not only wanted to make uh, this uh, RFID tracking project possible, but we tried to create a very generic hardware platform which uh, enables, for example, scientists to create uh, micro netting networks or uh, uh, wireless sensors and everything. So every, for example, tag, uh, maybe a few people of you uh, bought, is, uh, for example, able to receive and transmit data, which we are later explain. Um, because in this particular instance of Open Beacon, all your tags you currently wear uh, started to talk to each other. Last year's version of Open Beacon was pretty simplistic. We didn't want to take chances. So uh, the tags were just blindly transmitting, no matter if there is a tracking infrastructure available, no matter if you're on the BCC, they were just transmitting constantly uh, their beacon packets. Although they are encrypted, so you can't be tracked by others. Only people that know uh, the secret key uh, we use uh, in our firmware. But uh, it was a very stupid protocol. Uh, the background is that it's very cheap in terms of power consumption to transmit short packets. In the case of two uh, megabits, the packet transmission is surprisingly low. So the actual packet on, earth, uh, on air takes 600 microseconds. So even in a crowded situation, we have, have thousands of people, uh, the likelihood of a collision is very, very low. So um, we thought, okay, that's easily possible to uh, build a tracking upon this technology. And by getting rid of the back channel, uh, which could result in uh, 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 freezes of the system, because if you, if, for example, imagine 1,000 people talking to a reader and saying, hello, I'm here, and uh, they will obviously cancel out their own transmission, and they will obviously have to uh, repeat this transmission uh, if there is uh, the connection fails. Uh, thanks. Um, and uh, this could uh, uh, reside in lockup. So therefore we took no chances, said, okay, we make a very simple version. Privacy is a top priority for us. So we wanted to make sure that whoever has access uh, to this data, this results in well-defined uh, conditions. So basically we are in control what we get and what data we re uh, release afterwards. And obviously it needs to be fail safe because uh, you think about a technology, uh, say, okay, it might work, but obviously at some point you have to spend actual money to build 1,000 of these devices and to simply try it out. So if in case of a failure, uh, this could obviously result in a problem. So, but this year, uh, we decided to uh, bring, with the help of Tiro, to a uh, new length uh, and uh, by introducing a text talking to each other. So additionally to the announcement of uh, um, the um, former Open Beacon protocol, which basically on a scheme where you have transmissions on four power levels and the resulting packet loss is used to determine the actual distance to every reader, you additionally have a second channel where you have encrypted transmissions between all the tags. And here, every tag uh, can find out about other tags in its proximity. So every tag is now a sniffer and registers incoming packets, decrypts them, takes uh, the tag ID out, 
and retransmits them along with the normal tracking packets to a server. So we slightly changed our uh, format and the uh, results were really mind-boggling what data uh, was made available that. And Chiro will now explain you uh, what they did. Thank you. Can you hear me? Yeah, I guess so. Okay. So first of all, I would like to thank the, the organizers and the program committee of the CCC for having me here. And I would like to thank uh, uh, the OpenAMD and Open uh, Beacon team here at 25C3, uh, and in particular, uh, Brita and Milos Meriak for their support and very interesting and exciting interactions. Uh, what I will uh, talk about in the next 25, 30 minutes uh, is a project that we started uh, building exactly on top of the Open Beacon platform uh, at the Institute for Scientific Interchange in Torino. Most of us are actually physicists, and our interest here is not in the physics of the devices, but actually in what uh, kind of patterns and network structure you can mine uh, in terms of social activity when you deploy these devices inside the community in a, in a close environment. Uh, so, uh, very briefly, this is the outline of the, the next 20 minutes. Uh, I will show you how we can modify the platform developed by, by Milos and his team in order to detect reliably face-to-face -face social interactions. And then I will show you what kind of results uh, you can get by focusing on a couple of small-scale conferences that we um, performed, that we studied uh, uh, back in Italy. And, uh, and I, will, I will show at the end some, some very early, very preliminary results regarding the experiment which is uh, uh, currently running here at 25 City. Uh, if you have any questions, feel free to interrupt me at any time. I, I enjoy that. Okay. So, why do we want to uh, detect contact between people? Uh, that's, there are many reasons. Uh, the, the problem is the following. Imagine that you have a room, uh, like, like it happens uh, in many places in this, uh, in this building, where you have groups of people interacting, talking socially with each other. Uh, basically, what you want to do is, ideally, to mine in real time this kind of structures, okay? groups of people interacting socially with each other. Now, by, by interacting socially, you can mean many things. In, uh, in the following, I will mean just the face-to-face -face interaction, which is usually a good proxy for a social contact. It means if you spend 10 minutes in front of each other, uh, within one meter, you're probably doing something together and probably talking. And, okay, so ideally, you want to mine this graph structure from the real world data of, of social contact. And uh, why do you want to do that? Uh, this may be a reason, but, but basically the problem is that we lack fundamental knowledge on human contact. I mean, paradoxically, we know much better how the surface of the moon looks uh, than what are the statistical properties of the contact between, uh, between people. And, and these statistical properties, knowing how many contacts uh, are there, how do they last uh, this kind of uh, information, is crucial because uh, uh, to date a lot of information uh, is, is somehow riding on these contacts. So you can, you can easily imagine that in the future we'll have peer-to-peer -peer, uh, mobile content distribution platforms uh, and they will rely and they will have to be designed in order to be aware of these contact partners. There are, there are reasons which are uh, even more practical uh, when, when you study epidemics, when you study airborne diseases, such as SARS, for example, um, you would like really to model the scenario in which a person in here has, has an airborne disease, or something serious, and you ask the question, okay, at the end of the day, how many hackers are, are sick? How many will be dead in a week? Okay, so, so far, basically, there is no fundamental knowledge uh, that would allow us to model these kind of processes. And most epidemiological models uh, model uh, the, uh, the interaction in closed spaces as a random graph. Uh, and as I will show you, this is absolutely not the case. And so there are a lot of heterogeneity. There are a lot of features which actually make the spreading of diseases uh, uh, very different. Okay, so we lack this knowledge. And th these are all scientific reasons. I already mentioned this. Uh. And then there is another issue that ideally, um, we would like to integrate in real time uh, data from the real world from sensors with data from online systems. So you have seen that uh, on the web during this conference it was available a web client showing your ego network, the network centered on you, showing your friends, the friends of your friends, which contacts were actually active at the time. Uh, 
if you push this one step further, what happens is that you will be able in the near future to, to browse the, the same kind of information on a mobile device. Uh, and, uh, and if you imagine what will happen maybe in uh, four or five years, uh, uh, mobile devices will have uh, several ways of assessing proximity and their relations, uh, and you will be able to enrich in real time the social, the social interaction you're having with people uh, with contextual information which depend on who they are. So there are really several uh, uh, reasons why you want to do that. Now, what do you need in order to be able to reliably perform contact detection? This is the process we want to affect. Uh, uh, you need a special resolution of the order of one meter. This means that basically if you, if you use position locative technologies, inexpensive locative technologies, as a proxy for contact, uh, that's not good enough. The, the resolution you have in the visualization that you see uh, spinning uh, in the, at the Open Beacon uh, booth uh, has a resolution of like five meters, uh, six five meters, uh, exactly. And uh, of course it depends on density on the antennas, uh, uh, but it's not good enough to assess social contact. You cannot reliably detect face-to-face -face interaction within one meter. Then there is an issue of anisotropy. I mean, two people facing each other is different from two people facing away from each other. And, and if you look just at position, you're not able, of course, to, to resolve this. And uh, the other thing is that you need the temporal resolution of the order of the scale over which people move around, which is like five, 10 seconds, the time it takes for a social contact to assess and break, in a sense. This is the fastest time. And, uh, and, and of course, it needs to be unobtrusive. You need to, to have small devices. There were early exploration of these concepts uh, at the MIT Media Lab where they were using what they call sociometric badges, which are rather bulky devices. They capture a lot of information, a lot of context, the tone of the voice of the wearer, a lot of, of relevant information if you want to do anthropological uh, or organizational modeling. Uh, but they are obtrusive. People are aware of them, and, uh, and in principle, you can never rule out that this awareness biases the interactions. So you want something that people do not are aware of at some point. And of course, you want to scale. In order to scale, you need to have very cheap devices, uh, possibly manufactured like the, the Open Beacon devices uh, from off-the-shelf uh, hardware. And, uh, and, and then, of course, I mean, and this is in, uh, along the lines that are uh, most interesting for people attending this kind of events, uh, we really want this platform to be open in order to for, for scientists, for practitioners, for people to, to hack it, to, to, to build stuff on it. I mean, if, uh, if Milo Shedden decided to make this platform open, as a scientist, we wouldn't have been able to, to modify it and, uh, and do science on top of it and, uh, and use it in order to gain extended uh, knowledge. So uh, Milo already spoke about the, the, the open beacon tags. Uh, let me just repeat that the active RFID tags, uh, they're very easy to pre-program. In, uh, in the default behavior, they just uh, scream on, on a given radio channel their identity. Uh, so the data collection pipeline is really simple in that case. Uh, you have tag uh, 42, which emits uh, a packet. In the packet, there is, uh, which is encrypted, there is embedded information at which the transmitter on the device was asked to emit the, the packet. And then there is a collection infrastructure and this collection infrastructure eventually encapsulates the, the radio packets over UDP, streams them over the local network until you get to, to a data analysis, storage, and, and, and collection system. So this is rather simple. Um, I'll show you what you can do, what we did here in, uh, in May uh, at a small conference. This was with about 70 people in, uh, at our premises in Torino, so it was easy for us to wire up the, the environment. Uh, we had basically three rooms. This was a cafeteria, this is a bar, and this is uh, uh, the conference room and the locations, the dots mark the, the readers. And, uh, and in this case, we used the, the, the system basically to assess co-presence uh, in, uh, in the vicinity of a station. Okay, so in what you will see in the following, uh, uh, maybe, yes, consists of a graph where a node is a person and two nodes are connected if those two persons are seen, have been seen by the same station during the last 10, 20 seconds, okay? So because of this, uh, and because basically you have a very coarse kind of spatial resolution, uh, the graph will look very clickish. You, you won't be able to resolve small groups of people. You, you will just see a uh, vicinity relationship. Here, the, the different readers, the antennas are laid out like this in order to provide some sort of spatial grounding. This is not spatially grounded. Here, the position in this graph is not representative or, or easily mapped to position in space. Uh, even though the points gravitate towards the antennas that see them uh, uh, most often or the strongest. 
So you see this is 9.30 in the morning and uh, people are piling up in the, in the conference room. And you see that basically in this case we completely lack a resolution of what's happening in the conference room. The system basically tells us, okay, there are a lot of people uh, who are co-present uh, in the vicinity of these antennas, okay? And then what you see is that, uh, and this is kind of fun, during the coffee break, uh, and you can imagine what's gonna happen, of course. People <laughs> migrate uh, <laughs> to the bar. A few of them are really resisting and keep talking science. <laughs> Eventually they get absorbed, <laughs> but it's too late, okay? So this is the kind of information that you can This is the kind of information that you can get, but this is not good enough for science, okay? So what we wanted to do was move this platform one step further, and we have the hardware, which is very nice, we can reprogram it, and we really want to address this problem. Given this structure, how can we get this graph? And uh, we already, basically, Milos already solved for us these problems. We, this is unobtrusive, it's scalable, it's low cost, it's open, okay? We had to solve uh, three other problems. And I sort of re the spatial resolution issue in assessing contact uh, and the temporal resolution. That's, that's really not a big problem, actually. And uh, so this is the basic cycle of functioning of the standard open beacon firmware. You transmit, uh, then you sleep for a long time, and the system consumes very small amount of power, and then a, a timer wakes it up, you transmit again, and so on. This is randomized in order to minimize the probability of uh, in-air collisions. And uh, what we did is modify this simple scheme into something a little more complicated, where we work over two radio channels. And this is what we had here at 25C3. Uh, basically, when you transmit, uh, you transmit uh, a, over a complex cycle, where in seven times uh, out of eight, uh, you transmit on channel B. Channel B is used for uh, neighborhood sensing. It's used to, to talk to other devices which are in your proximity. On this channel, we are transmitting at the lowest powers. We are transmitting at power zero and power one. And then uh, one time out of eight transmissions, we talk on the channel which addresses the infrastructure, data collection infrastructure, and we cycle over different towers, as Milos was saying, in order to be able to compute drop rates at the different readers, uh, which are used for positioning. And then we use the strongest power at which you really don't have a lot of spatial resolution, so it's not very useful for positioning, especially in small environments. We use this contact, this, uh, this power, to deliver a report uh, of the tags that were seen most recently by a given tag. So basically, each tag uh, is listening for nearby tags on channel B, and then it says, okay, I am tag X, I have just seen tag Y on channel B, and this information is packed and sent on channel A, and received by the infrastructure. And in this case, the data collection pipelines become like this. Uh, imagine that you have now two tags. This is what was happening here at 25C3. On channel B, the signal from this um, device is captured by, the, by, by this receiver, and this receiver sends out a message saying, I am 42, I just saw 13 and power zero. And then again, you get to the infrastructure, you get uh, over UDP and then you capture the data, okay? And this works, actually, we tested this at our lab, and for example, this, this was a small room, like maybe like this, um, this part, uh, with four desks in it. And, uh, and so here we were placing two tags on one desk and three tags on another desk, and you see that the structure is, uh, is correctly represented. And here we have two tags on one desk, two tags on another desk, and one alone sitting on another desk, and so on. Four on a desk and uh, one alone, uh, all five together. So we really tested this extensively. These were five tags in a line, and you see the topology is captured correctly. And uh, so we, we validated this, and, uh, and basically uh, what we see is that with the hardware we had there and with the software we had there, we could assess very reliably face-to-face, -face, uh, I mean proximity within one meter. Now there is still the issue of the uh, anisotropy, the fact that we want to be able to detect uh, two persons uh, facing each other with respect to two persons facing away from each other, but that's solved by physics because the, uh, the um, uh, radio frequency at which these devices work, which is in the range of 2.4 gigahertz, uh, is heavily absorbed by water and your body is 70% water. And this means that when you wear as a badge, like many of you are wearing now the device, uh, you're only shining radiation at the power, at the lowest power level in a cone which, which is in front of you. You're not shining radiation to your back. And this basically solves the problem of, of detecting in, in a reliable way face-to-face -face interaction. Of course, if you wear them on your back, then you, you're messing up with our system. Please don't do that. So at, uh, at 25C3, we, we moved one step further also the, the software. Really, in, along the lines of nothing to hide, we really wanted people 
to have their own monitoring station on their, on their computer, on their web browser. And so thanks to the work of Out and Wonderbreak, which uh, works for us uh, at, at ISI, we set up this, uh, this nice Flash applet, which is embedded in the uh, 25C3 Open Beacon Open AMD pages. And, uh, and the processing that's going on uh, uh, right now uh, behind uh, the doors uh, is this one. Basically, you get the UDP packets from the, from the readers. Those are aggregated by, by a system written uh, in Python on top of Twisted, which basically uh, captures high frequency, the UDP packets, uh, and pumps them in an aggregated form over a TCP pipe. And then the TCP pipe is processed uh, by multiple uh, post-processing systems. One of them uh, is a backend engine which computes the graphs of proximity for a given room, for a given device, for a given set of stations, and so on. And then uh, this, uh, this backend is communicating again over TCP uh, using AMF messages uh, with, the, with the flash client. And these two guys talk, talk to each other, basically. And so what you can do is show what people in, uh, in uh, social network analysis call an ego network, a network center on yourself. And here, for example, we enter the, the, the code of uh, a tag sitting on the open MAD, open, open beacon uh, boot, uh, 1100. And so this is the central tag. And here we are showing its neighbors and the neighbors of its neighbors. And the, the yellow contacts are contacts which are ongoing. They are, they are current. They are happening now while the bluish greenish contacts uh, are actually uh, historical. So the fact that aesthetics and small caps are connected by this line means that they have spent time together, but they're not together right now, okay? While, for example, the fact that 1100, 1197 are connected by a yellow line means that they are together now. So this is the kind of information that's, that's shown here. And then as we have seen, you have also different views on, on the data. We really wanted people to have access to this kind of information in real time. And notice that this kind of information is a sort of a dream for people doing epidemiology. If, uh, if you see how people uh, do this kind of stuff in hospitals uh, in recent years, they ask uh, uh, doctors, uh, health workers, uh, to have notebooks with them and jot down who they have met during that day. And that's, you can imagine, collecting data this way is, uh, is a mess, uh, doesn't scale, and it actually impairs the possibility of this person of doing their work. So we do plan, for example, to deploy this infrastructure in a large hospital in Lyon very soon uh, to get data which are relevant for the spreading of uh, um, nosocomial uh, uh, diseases in, uh, in hospitals. And, and then I show you what we did uh, with this infrastructure again at our premises. This time we really don't care about positioning, so we had fewer antennas. And, uh, and this is the kind of interface that our users had. This was not a web-based one. You got a better interface, but uh, but these guys only had basically a large screen at the, at the conference, uh, and on this large screen they could see, again, a sort of spatial grounding for the different locations in the, in the building, and, uh, and then a contact network. And as you see, this is not clickish, clickish at all now. You can really resolve small groups of people. Uh, uh, on tapping the device, uh, uh, people could recall on the screen uh, statistics about themselves, and uh, specifically the system would tell them, you spent the most time with this guy, the second uh, most time with, with this other guy, and so on, a sort of ranking of co-presence and, and contact. And, and as you see, you can easily resolve groups of five, three, two people, uh, and so on. And uh, uh, just to show you what's, what's going on in, very, in a very coarse way, here you have the number of persons in, in the three different rooms uh, during a typical day of the conference. Uh, the, the, the red curve is the conference room, uh, the green curve is the bar, and the blue one is the cafeteria. So the structure was basically a morning session, an afternoon session with coffee breaks in between, and this was uh, lunch, basically. And we can, for example, zoom in on the coffee break because we know it's fun. And, and so we can, for example, go, let's see. Here. Oops. Okay. Now you see that this looks very different. When, uh, when people, I'm sorry, when people are sitting uh, in, uh, in the conference room, now you don't see this huge blob uh, wobbling. You see just uh, a few pairwise contacts, which are people actually turning towards each other to comment uh, uh, about the ongoing talk. Okay. So this really tells us that we are, do, we are performing a very a much more accurate kind of slicing of real-world information. And now the coffee break starts, people get up, they start to talk to each other, 
and they move. And you see that in this case, you, you can really resolve uh, small cliques, small separated, well separated groups of, of people. So this, uh, this new sort of firmware is actually capturing in a much more reliable way uh, interaction which are socially uh, relevant. And then you can see that at some point the coffee breaks uh, ends. Uh, unfortunately, it was a very good day, so people went out and, uh, and, and to enjoy the sun, and so we lost, we, we lost a lot of signal during the coffee break. And here they go back, uh, you still see a few people chatting with each other before the session begins, it's 11.09. Things slow down a bit and you are only left after some time just with the pairwise interaction of people turning towards uh, each other. So this is the kind of information that you can get. Uh, and uh, well, I'll stop here. But uh, on a quantitative point of view, uh, things look very different now because for example, uh, here you have the, the number of persons in the conference room. Uh, so this, uh, when the number drops, this corresponds to coffee breaks. Uh, and now what you see is that uh, the number of contacts that the person has ongoing uh, is actually going up uh, during the breaks. So when, when the situation is less crowded, which is really what you want. I mean, when you are sitting like this in a room, uh, there is no ongoing social contact. You are all facing me, you are all facing the screen, uh, you're not facing each other. So the average number of contacts that each of you has ongoing is actually low, maybe when you turn to your neighbor, okay? While as soon as this all will be over and you will go outside or you will stand here and start chatting with each other, you will start having more contacts. So here, the system is really able to capture this. Uh, and uh, you can go a little deeper and you can ask, okay, what, are, what is the number of groups of two people, three people, four people, the number of clicks that you have as a function of time? And again, you see that there is an interim structure, basically, uh, except for groups of two people which are present uh, at almost all time, the groups of three people, the blue lines, and the groups of four people are, are almost uh, only present during the breaks. Uh, what's interesting is that uh, the spiking of the groups of two people marks the end of the talks. So within a single session, you see this spike uh, in pairs of people interacting marks the end of this popular talk uh, where people were really turning to each other and commenting and chatting. And there are several of these. So basically by using uh, this kind of more refined network observables, you're able to extract much more relevant information from the time series of this, uh, of this information. You see, all, you can basically tell where each talk begins and ends by using this info. And, uh, uh, and then before closing down, let me just point, uh, point out that uh, there are very interesting irregularities in human contact, which are rather surprising. They're not completely unexpected, but they're surprising if you consider that uh, we are all free to do whatever we want in terms of movement, in terms of people that we go and talk to. Uh, but then if you measure by using this system the, the probability of observing a contact of a given duration, you ask the question, how many contacts lasting two minutes have happened? How many contacts lasting 10 minutes have happened? How many contacts lasting one hour have happened? And then what you see is that there is a very strong uh, regularity. Here we are plotting the probability of observing uh, or the likelihood of observing of a, con a contact lasting delta t seconds uh, as a function of, the, of that length on a log-log scale, okay? On a log-log scale, a straight line uh, is a power law behavior, so the functional form of this guy is uh, delta t to the minus two. You don't need to care about that, but, but it's really, uh, I'm showing this just because it's striking that uh, if you take 40 people, you observe them for a couple of hours, you get this kind of very strong statistical regularities, uh, which are really important because the moment you have this kind of knowledge, uh, you can disregard all the details of the complexity of social interactions, and for example, uh, create epidemiological models, model of information propagation, of information spreading, which are realistic because they have the right statistics of the, of the contacts. They, you, you were able to experimentally extract uh, quantitative information which is robust and can be used to, to inform modeling and the design of, of systems. So it's really striking that human dynamics is this regular. And then of course you can play games. You can say, okay, imagine that at this conference there was a patient zero with some very bad disease, uh, and that's the red guy. And you can play back an infection dynamics. You can simulate a very simple epidemiological model on the real contact network. And so what we are doing here is pushing uh, forward, uh, in, in a sense, epidemiological modeling uh, by providing it with uh, data which are grounded on the real life behavior of people. And then you have to plug in just a model for epidemic uh, transmission on top of it. And so here you see basically that during the, during the conference, not many people are infected. Most of them get infected, of course, during the breaks when, when you really spend time talking to each other. 
And then the last thing that I want to show you is, uh, is the cumulative contact network. And this is the historical network that you can see in the view on your clients. And, uh, and in this case, uh, two nodes are connected uh, if they have spent time together. And the strength of the connection depends on how much time they spend together. And what you can do in this case is do a sort of reverse engineering of social interactions because at the, at the end of the day, you're accumulating a lot of information about who spends time with, with uh, and by using background information, you can basically uh, work back the identity of nodes for, for which you don't know the identity just because you can somehow correlate this, this network with, uh, with background information. And here, for example, you can see that this is an organizer and at the end of the day, this node will be a hub in the network. The organizer needs to talk to a lot of people. And so basically by using very simple network observable, you can point out social roles. Uh, and, uh, and even, you know, sometimes we had a couple of tags that were failing, we needed to replace them, but the person hadn't agreed to, uh, to share their, their name. And it was very easy for us to just look at this graph and tell, oh, this must be this guy. And we were going to the guy and he was surprised. Oh, you're not supposed to know who I am. And, and of course, we, don't, we didn't know the association, but we knew the association of his neighbors, and that makes his, uh, his privacy uh, somehow compromised. So th this is really an interesting observation in general, that your privacy is dependent on the, on, on, on the care that your neighbors, that your social contacts uh, take in managing their privacy. So it's not really your problem, it's a global problem of privacy in terms of, of network. And uh, here, for example, we, we had a little fun by plotting the cumulative contact network uh, uh, by profiling nodes. Uh, we, had, we had rich profiles with nationality, languages spoken, uh, um, academic status, and so on. And so you, you can clearly see like kind of antisocial persons who never met with anybody. And uh, you can clearly see the organizers who are these two guys. Uh, you can see affinities and homophily uh, related to language, related to co-publishing papers related to co-presence at institutions and so on. So there is really a lot to, to talk about, but I just want to give you uh, an idea of what you can do once you get your hands on, on this kind of data. And this is, for example, a very rough preliminary uh, snapshot of the cumulative contact network that we had here at uh, 25C3. So I guess a few of you may, may find your nick or your ID on this graph. And, and here again, you see that there are some, some contacts which are strong, some group of people that are highly connected. There are people who act uh, as bridges between different uh, communities. And, uh, and there are small groups of isolated people. There are a lot of pairs uh, and, and so on. So we, we plan to publish this data and uh, some preliminary analysis on the website of our project. I will show you the URL at the end. Unfortunately, we didn't have time to, to prepare like in-depth analysis uh, by the time this talk was supposed to be delivered but we will provide it uh, nevertheless uh, after the conference on the website, either of the conference or of our project. And so what, what about the future? In the future, we would like to, to have a couple of large scale experiment. Here we had about 400 people. We would like to scale to 1,000, 1,500, because that's the right size for a lot of uh, problems, uh, uh, especially for epidemiology. Uh, we have several medium scale experiment plan where we want to explore instead different kind of connection, integration of background information. Uh, uh, and, uh, and it's important uh, for us to really cover a variety of contexts. We, we, we want to cover conferences like this one, uh, office behaviors, organizational dynamics, uh, hospitals, as I mentioned, museums. In museums, this is very easy, and museums are very interested in having this information because uh, uh, they often ask this question on whether uh, things or artifacts that they place in the environment shape the social interaction. I mean, where, what can I place in this environment in order to, to, have, to, to make people stay here, to, to make them more social in this area or to, to make them go fast through this area and, and so on. So scientifically, there are several goals. Uh, as I mentioned, we cover human dynamics, the, the longitudinal analysis, the analysis in time of the contact networks of persons, epidemiology organizational, understanding, for example, and mining informal networks. If you have an organization, you want to know who is the important guy. And, and, and that's not necessarily the guy who has the top in the organism. I mean, Maybe the important guy is some guy who has no special role in the, in the formal structure of the, of the company, of the organization, but still you need to recognize that role. And, uh, and this kind of techniques, of course, with I mean, huge impacts for privacy, allow you to pinpoint who, who these persons are. And, uh, and then integration with the background knowledge is really something that, uh, that I like, especially I like this notion that was introduced at uh, MIT of social serendipity. That is the idea that if you have access to the graph structure of contact, uh, what you can do is look up information about these connections in online bodies of knowledge, and then basically feed this information back in real time to the people. So you can imagine a situation where 
uh, I am spending a lot of time with Milos, but we are not connected on LinkedIn. Uh, and, and after a while, we get on our mobile phone or in our email a message telling us, okay, you guys are spending time together, and if you want to connect to him on LinkedIn, on Facebook, click here. Okay, so this is, the, of course, this is really exploring a boundary, but, but I think that this, this blurring uh, the, the offline and the online uh, representation of the world is really one of the, the interesting things to come. And that's one of the things that we'd like to, uh, to explore. So let me just acknowledge uh, a lot of people who made possible uh, this experiment here. This was very hard. It was really a fight battle. And, uh, and Milos made an extreme effort in order to, to, to make this happen. And so we are really, we are really glad uh, and, uh, to, to Milos, uh, to Bit Manufacture, to the organizer at 2053, and to, and to you all for, for making this happen. And if you are interested a bit more in the science, uh, there is something you can read uh, here, and, uh, and, um, and more analysis and information will, will, uh, will be posted to the blog of our project uh, uh, here on Sociopathy. And thank you very much for your attention. Hello, uh, so uh, let's uh, do a short summary of what we uh, heard here. So maybe some of you are furious. How can we do uh, such things? So how is, can be the CCC connected to such atrocities to data mine people at their own conference while fighting for uh, privacy? And he's doing it in a way to his own people like no one did ever before and probably the next few years no one will do. <laughs> so uh, what is the idea behind this? So what we wanted to show is that this is not, a, not uh, the future what we are talking about. Obviously, there will some companies come out with products that will look very similar because obviously the data that results from such uh, um, uh, approaches is very, very valuable. Uh, obviously, you can see how important people are. You can uh, pinpoint your efforts to the few important people. You don't have to talk to the suckers, you only have to tell the few persons, uh, you know uh, which people are, for example, less integrated, uh, you can find weaknesses very easily, it's, uh, there will be probably, uh, I think, the biggest market around this will be probably on big trade shows, where people will be systematically data mined, I expect a huge market there, so this will happen here, but this is the future. But uh, the future is, in fact, already there. Um, you people carry these mobile phones around, which collect the very same data. So while you travel around, going to your daily jobs, or travel with public transportations, or traveling by car, meeting friends, uh, this data is already there. And uh, usually, you know it best, if data is there, people will use it. So please be aware what data, what tracks you leave in your environment. So mobile phones are a big issue, uh, and uh, most of uh, you people additionally give information, like Chiro already mentioned, uh, to others by, for example, publishing uh, pictures on Flickr. So even if few of you people and are trying to guard their privacy, this is not possible anymore, because if there are two persons around that give a shit about privacy, they will also uh, inflict you. Your price will be moved. You will be on pictures uh, on Flickr. Not pictures you took, but your friends took. So obviously we are looking at one of the biggest privacy threats in the future and there's obviously a lot to explain. Uh, the motto of the Congress is nothing to hide. The problem is with nothing to hide is that people think, okay, it's public data. I walk from this room to this room, everyone can see it, it's public, why should I care? But uh, in reality, if you systematically try to uh, data mine this uh, uh, data, you get all the network, you remove all the trash, and you get the re really valuable information, so you have to be careful about this. Um, I think uh, we have, how many time do we have left? Okay, so 
what I want to hear from you, what is your opinion about all this? And uh, I'm very interested to your questions and to your thoughts about this. What do you think about this experiment? So, any questions? Yeah, one of the outcomes of this is probably that you can, um, it would result in self-fulfilling prophecies in the sense that uh, if, if you can, if you have access to this kind of data and you begin to realize, as you had mentioned, that, you know, the, the person who appears to be the big boss is not really the guy who is, whom you should be focusing on, but you should be focusing on this guy who has got the most connections. So you could potentially just go and stand there facing him for a little while mm -hmm. and uh, become part of his clique according to this, so that later on if someone tries to look at these graphs, determines that you are actually also an important person uh, as part of this. Yeah, but it's I think... It's easy to game the system. I think uh, the past, uh, in the past we uh, uh, saw it in a different way happen. You have such systems, there is huge data money going on, but exactly as you point out, the trick is not to change uh, your, uh, your environment by showing, okay, I measured you, here is how it looks like, but to make it uh, hidden so people, only few selected people know about the results and these selected people are able to uh, do their, whatever they do with the data. Yeah, but but then, it's not public. Yeah, but one of the issues is that I may not know who is doing the analysis, yeah. but I know that the analysis is being done. Mm -hmm. And I know that I am being observed and I know that my actions are being reflected in some form or the other in a graph like this. And uh, if I am able to determine in some fashion that you know, this is, this is how it's being done. I can game the system by simply determining who's the most popular guy in the room. And it's not the big man standing in the corner or whether who you think everyone would go to, but it seems to be that small clock over there who's handing out the food coupons. Mm -hmm. And uh, you suddenly become, you know, you raise your level of importance in some fashion mm -hmm. or the other. Yeah, so this is also uh, one of our main drives that we try to make the system now for you as open as possible so we see exactly like uh, a tool uh, which uh, pointed this out, uh, is uh, what can I do? Obviously, I can introduce a lot of noise in the system. But like Chiro pointed out, I can wear the tag however it looks like. Uh, uh, on my back, I can share my mobile phones with my friends, whatever. So obviously, you can poison this uh, uh, kind of data. And uh, we also took as a project we obviously have a huge responsibility. We created, for proving that this can be done, the <laughs> one of the biggest technical tools to make it happen. So what did we do to uh, make sure that it <coughs> won't fall in the wrong hands and if it will fall in the wrong hands, it will poison them? Um, we made this hardware open hardware. So even we can't make money of this. Um, if someone wants to take this, hardware and we are simply too expensive, then he can build it on his own. So the profit margin is very low. So by introducing such tools into the open market and with uh, and creating by providing this whole tool set a very low profit margin, a lot of companies say, does not make sense to compete in this market. There are already solutions around this. I may have fancy patents, but I don't expect uh, too much profit margin with it. So I think there are possibilities to uh, at least slow down this process a lot. And I think this is an interesting contribution to A, show the dynamics behind it, so people can use it in a better way. Uh, so in our experience, people don't complain as long as you give them the free choice to decide when do I want to be uh, tracked. So obviously, you are interest, uh, interested in when I walk around the conference, who did I meet? Uh, what are their connections? Oh, he knows this guy. I can talk to him. Uh, let me introduce. Uh, uh, let him introduce me to another guy I'm interested in. Um, this is a very interesting tool set, uh, and I think because you find it interesting, you are willing to release this data. But as soon as you have privacy concerns, you have to have a possibility to shut this off, and uh, this awareness to train this awareness. When do I want to leave traces? And when is the border, okay, here, stop. Here, I'm not willing to leave any more traces. And which traces are, uh, for example, can be harmful. 
And this is what we want to achieve with this project. So to get this uh, kind of data more attendance. Yes. Next question. Well, it's not um, directly a question, but um, what I found out, like you said, it's good to have um, the possibility of turning that things off. Um, you can easily found, find out if um, someone's going out of this uh, center across the street and oops, he's gone. Or you can maybe find out um, if his business gone too long um, or just having a, a short break or something like that. It's very impressive. Um, one example from me, um, I walked into the toilet and some guys told me, um, you're blinking, what's that? And I told him, okay, that's the possibility to turn something off. I won't track be I won't be tracked in here, because I don't want to know that anyone else knows that I'm on the toilet now. <laughs> yeah. yeah, and uh, because you see the immediate results here, so you uh, started to get. I think I hopefully think you get more aware that what actually happened. So. Uh, for example, huge companies, I don't want to, I, I think I don't uh, want to uh, tell you the names, are uh, trying to do it in the hidden. So uh, people won't get upset, why should they? It's part of data, you walk around in your store, you get uh, the right advertisements, you don't get annoyed by the wrong catalogs sent to you. So it's very uh, unobtrusive. It's, uh, it's customers never see what's behind this facade. And I think uh, we achieve that, that you start to get aware of what happens with this kind of data, okay? Uh, I have another question. Um, do you know how um, correct your data is? Are there false positives and do you maybe have um, compared it to video surveillance of such a conference? Um, I don't think that you really uh, can compare it to, uh, I think you will get a complete different set of uh, data because obviously you are interested in some persons, for example, if someone is talking, you're interested in, but you don't maybe want to talk to him personally, but you take part in the same group. But if you make a survey, uh, uh, a survey you won't tell, oh, I'm part of this group of this cryptographer or whatsoever. You just are in his click without basically telling it in a survey. But I think Chiro can say something for this. Uh, I guess, can you hear me this? Oh, yeah. Okay. Uh, validating the data is one of the big issues indeed because uh, that's why we started, for example, in our experiments uh, with very small groups because we wanted to be able to relate what the system told us about the structure, the topology of the interaction with, with what we were able to see with our eyes. So we, we really spend a lot of time, entire days, having people standing in rooms in group of three or four and we are telling them, okay, now you move to that group and now you come back. And, uh, and besides having these guys very upset at us, we, we, really, we really were able to validate uh, that uh, uh, with the settings and the parameters we had for our experiments back in Italy, we were able to, to, to detect very reliably face-to-face -face interactions. Of course, you do have false positives and you do have uh, false negatives. That's, uh, that's part of the game. But, but the important thing is that you know that the, no the noise level is low and that you know that the error is controllable. You, you know the statistics of the error. The other thing is that uh, even in cases when, when uh, and, and this is the worrisome thing. It's very easy to detect when people are trying uh, to mess with you because basically if you put the, the tag on your back, uh, suddenly the statistics of your contact times, they're all wrong. And, uh, and so by just uh, mining the network in clever ways, so you can tell, okay, this guy is playing tricks and you just remove the nodes. So it's, uh, it's very easy to use a lot of mathematics from complex network theory to clean up the data and to, and to somehow uh, remove uh, uh, noise that is deliberately introduced in the system. The other thing which I would like to mention is that uh, um, uh, even though we are all scared by the, 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 the big brother, uh, it's actually even more scary how people themselves start using these technologies uh, uh, very, very happily. We had this screen uh, 
And, uh, and what, we, what we saw after a couple of days of people playing around when they had become confident and aware of this, uh, this possibility is that, for example, if an important guy, if a very well-known scientist <coughs> entered with, together with somebody, you would see a bunch of people running to the screen and looking up the connection to, to see who the other guy was. So it's, uh, it's, really, it's really scary how, how easily people adopt these things, how, how much they, they start using them. And so that's, that's another issue which we really need to address, I mean, in, in how we expose this information. And again, there is an issue of responsibility in uh, uh, that information is there and, uh, and it's there for use to, for, for everybody. And, uh, and, and it's very important that, in a sense, uh, uh, there are provocations in order that people become aware of the issues because before they get used to, to the technology and to what they can do with the technology while, while it still feels new. And just to give you a short reality check, so obviously you think, oh, we are here the 25 C3, we have here a lot of bright young people which are very aware of uh, privacy rights. They, are, they will protect their privacy very well. They are aware what can happen to their valuable data. But from my experience, uh, Chiro can uh, correct me, um, this time we took it to a different new level. Unlucky Aesthetics is uh, not here. Uh, he did amazing work with uh, some other people together on the Hope Conference in New York and he was willing to come here and to work very hard day and night without sleep to uh, make this happen on 25C3. Uh, three, uh, uh, we introduced a lot of additional data mining possibilities. For example, you were uh, able at an early point to uh, sign up for talks you want to attend. Which obviously is interesting. I can correlate it with what you want to attend, what you think that people want to see you attending, and what you're personally interested in. For example, if you have a talk about privacy and you end, uh, leave in half the time, then obviously it has things about you. Um, and uh, there were a lot of possibilities where people left data. Uh, you could, uh, for example, ping uh, friends that were suggested by you to the system, uh, from the system based on their, the talks they signed up, based on the uh, rooms uh, they were in, based on the interests they registered on our website. Uh, you could enter handle, you could enter your age, you could enter your email address, uh, your interest, everything. And you would expect that people come here bashing to us and say, oh, why do you care, uh, collect this data? No single person asked me what will happen with this data. We can tomorrow put it into a, <laughs> into a newspaper and say, here is the data, email addresses, private interests, people they met, uh, websites they have. No one really cared at the 25C3, so think about it. <laughs> yeah, and uh, they trust Google, they trust Microsoft. It's good that you trust. It's good in this time that people still have trust. <laughs> Thank you a lot. <laughs>